Okay, good evening, gentlemen. Church history study, and uh, as we were talking about at dinner beforehand, we are drawing to a conclusion here. We're getting you know, near the finish line here probably next week. Uh, so probably this week and next week. We'll probably wrap it up next week. Uh, and that would, should be apparent as we've been the last couple of weeks. We've been into the 19th century. And we're now into the 20th century. And we talked about uh, really the last couple months because it's this process that we've seen certainly since the 19th century, you know, mid, early to mid 1800s, we really see a big shift. We've talked about a lot of the modern day cults that came out of the 1800s, a lot of the, um, you know, bad theology and just different directions. We saw how after that second great awakening uh, here in America, we saw, you know, decisionism and we saw how Arminianism really infiltrated the church and, and majority of the churches shifted into liberal theology, into Arminianism and easy believism and decisionism. Remember, uh, all that means really picture the uh, stadiums. Uh, or evangelical outreach that we do, uh, you know, just kind of say, say this prayer, raise your hand, um, you know, bringing people, church services and, and evangelistic outreach was now uh, brought to uh, a, a, a decision, essentially, and that's what decisionism means. So everything is orchestrated, the music, the teaching, the preaching, everything is orchestrated to kind of come to this crescendo at the end of the service of make a decision to accept Christ and to follow Christ. And so uh, we saw that a lot and, and uh, just that transition and again into liberal theology, which really when we think about liberal theology, that took over in the seminaries and it certainly took over the churches and we've seen these waves of that. We talked about also the charismatic movements, the three waves, and really we're in a fourth wave right now of uh, the charismatic movement with the uh, new apostolic reformation and things that are happening uh, and going on currently. But, uh, you know, it's just these, these things that continue to cycle into the church that we've seen in this study for, you know, uh, for the last 2,000 years of New Testament church history. These cults aren't new. This liberalism isn't new. Uh, you know, these thoughts aren't new. They just continue to creep in. But the difference is, looking at where we are today, um, you can certainly see, actually, I listened to a podcast and to a, a teaching today where someone was saying this, and, and many of you guys have heard me say this many times. For several years, I've been saying that the evangelical church of the United States needs reformation um, because it's so far off the tracks, uh, in my opinion. You know, that it, not all, obviously, we've got to um, understand that, but many um, that, that are doing church the way that they're doing in the path and the direction and the things that they're teaching and all that has certainly got off the tracks of what we would call orthodox you know teachings and so through the course of history we've seen that happen but we've always seen men who have stood and opposed that and stood up to the um, task of trying to defend you know the orthodox church and the orthodox teachings so um, you know with the day and age that we live in now just so much tolerance and so much you know, everything's got to be acceptable. We have to be politically correct. We certainly live in a time and a day and age in the church even where uh, the church has even, you know, been um, influenced by that. So, you know, if, if a church were to stand up for it, then they're the ones that get called bigots, you know, and, and uh, all the names that they want to call us because we are intolerant of homosexual marriage or abortion or whatever the hot-button topics <coughs> are of the day. Um, certainly we are the ones that are in the minority now, you know, and, and we certainly understand that that's been a slippery slope that we've been looking at um, in the church history study. So last week we talked about a few um, theologians, a few preachers. Remember we talked about D.L. Moody, we talked about Billy Sunday, we talked last week about Charles Spurgeon. Um, so that was some good information and insight on him, just another one of those great preachers that we've seen uh, now as we're transitioning into the 20th century. Okay, uh, any thoughts, questions, or comments, or anything like that before we uh, get into it? Yes, sir? Um, I just, just touched on the decisionism that we just spoke about. Yeah. Uh, like, I kind of, which I know we've, we've talked about a lot, but That's I kind of okay. have a problem with, like, the, the whole deal, which I know is what you said, but it's not really correct. Um, you know, like, um, it to me it's it's like um, acts it's like uh, what do you call it? works mm -hmm. like you know how can if they lead the sermon up to telling people to make a decision to to 
to accept Christ in their heart when everything that I've learned was is that you don't make a decision. It's not sure. on you, you know. I mean, there's no Sure. Well that so that would be the shift really what happened there, remember, was the what we now know or we now label or call, you know, Arminianism and Calvinism. And then remember we talked about that. Even Calvin would never want that to be labeled after him. He didn't he didn't do that. It happened later. Uh, remember with Tulip and all that stuff. Uh, he called himself, in fact, you know, Augustinian in his in his views because Augustine uh, against Pelagius talked about those same things. So that that Armenian versus Calvinism thing has been going on thousands of years before you know before Calvin was ever born. Uh, but just to make it a label that most of us understand through the study now is. You know, Calvinism is what you're you're expressing and saying that we teach here more of the reformed theology of God is sovereign in salvation. He chooses to show his grace and mercy upon who he chooses to. Uh, the Arminian view would be that men are capable of choosing to accept Jesus or to reject Jesus. Um, so those are the two sides of the coin that are opposing how that works now. Uh, can someone be saved believing one or the other? Certainly they can't, because conversion happens because it's a work of God. So my point being to us, Sky, is there are many, many, many brothers and sisters that are true believers that believe you can be saved by choosing to say a prayer after someone and, and asking Jesus into your heart. Although we would argue here at this church that that's not biblically how it happens, um, they would they would certainly believe that. And I have family members that are believers that believe that, and you know, many of us that are at other churches and things that teach that. Um, so that's the shift, though, that happened. Uh, that was not the orthodox view for thousands of years of the church. But now, like we were saying, in the last 200 years or so, it's become such, it, it just grew influence, it grew influence, it grew influence to where the majority of the American church today believes that way. The Arminianism, which is easy believe decisionism. Mm -hmm. Um, which is why most of their services you'll hear an altar call or you hear, you know, uh, you know, bow your head and close your eyes and say this prayer after me, you know, and you can be saved. And um, so that would be um, if there was a I just wanted to kind of give you the two sides and for us to remember that. I don't know if that's helped. Maybe the question you were trying to pose. But so in their view, they're not they're not like being heretical in their view. They're just they're giving the way of of what they've learned and what they perceive to be how to be saved that we should just preach the word and ask people to believe it. So, and certainly in scriptures, I want to make sure we're clear that there is the call to do that. So I would certainly, if there's a hundred people here, I would preach the gospel to all of them the same and say, yeah, repent. The Bible says that repent and believe and be saved. But I would not say to them, you know, sign this paper saying that you believe that or tell me, uh, say a prayer behind, you know, what do you, I do be saved? Well, say this prayer with me and you're saved. No, because I call that, and that's called the general call, but then there's what we call the effectual call, which is the Holy Spirit may move in these hundred people, say he moves seven people and changes their hearts, and they're born again right then. Those are the seven people who have been converted and saved. And it's because why? <clears throat> Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. It's because if I articulate the gospel from the scriptures of what the gospel is of Jesus Christ and how you're saved, then the Holy Spirit uses that. To, to save people. So, you know, that that would be how I, how I would kind of try to clarify that, if that helps. Cool. Uh, can I add? Uh, yes. Because there is tension. That's in, right. In what you're asking about. I mean, I think it's normal. Yeah, that was more of a clip wrestle, notes version. <laughs> to wrestle with that. Um, because, like he, like he just said, I mean, there is legitimacy in calling people to repent and believe, and that's specifically... You know the vocabulary words that Jesus used, right? When he called people, he said, "Repent and believe." So he didn't say, "You know, accept me." He didn't say, "Say this prayer." And so that was some of the commentary. Looking back on church history, we were saying maybe maybe the methods that they were using right. in their attempt to share the gospel weren't as biblical as they could be. Maybe we could do that a little better. And learning, today, I would say that certainly learning from from that. Um, but the technicality is. Man is responsible for the gospel, right? So God's going to hold them accountable for hearing the gospel preached. Like God's commanding them to to do, to act. Um, right. But you know, 
the technicality of the scriptures is man is not only does he not want to follow God and worship him he wants to worship himself he's incapable he's really incapable <laughs> because he's, he's dead in his sin and, and, and trespasses he's happy in that uh, and he's able to make decisions in the realm of his nature right. which is sinful nature so he's he's making decisions and doing actions in accordance with his sinful nature but he's never going to like you said do an act or make a decision of righteousness to obey God on his own on his own yeah. o- outside of the miracle working saving power of the Lord Jesus I mean like we were just talking earlier about uh, Saul being converted I mean he was kicking against the goats yep. Jesus described it as you know as hard as he could and then all of a sudden now he's doing righteousness. Well, how does that happen? It only happens by the miracle working grace. So so we do call people to act and respond to the gospel. We don't expect them to actually do anything with it unless the Spirit of God yep. you know, gives them the gift of repentance and the gift which of faith. Which he clearly does. Yeah, which he does. So, uh-huh. um, But how you understand those technicalities kind of will shape your methods right. of your presentation of the gospel. Yeah, it is. It's it is like you're saying, like technicality, and it's how you understand it, you know, the right way. But it's it's like you are making a decision, but you can't make the right decision without God's help. So, right. so it is kind of like you this. wouldn't make that decision unless He preordained it for you. That it's like that's almost like right. both sides are saying. If the He doesn't same intervene, thing, you like. can't make that Sometimes. decision. Right. It's like we're saying the same thing, but we're understanding it a little bit. He differently. gives you the understanding to be able to make that decision. Easier said that maybe, yeah, I don't know that maybe this doesn't help either, but, um, you know, people say, you know, accept Jesus. You know, accept Jesus in your heart and be saved. Really, the truth of the matter is, yeah, you don't accept Jesus. God accepts you (laughs) because of what Jesus did. (laughs) Uh, It's a total different, so verbiage, and again, Brian and I are big on that, vocabulary, Um, Jonathan as well, you know, vocabulary and, and verbiage and how we say things. Um, certainly is, is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, well, when like you a, get saved, that's how you feel. Like, like you feel like you Good. Well, now that that's cleared up, <laughs> <laughs> this is good. No, thank you, because, that look, that's a constant conversation that we have all the time, uh, even here in a, in a church where we teach, you know, the reformed thinking of soteriology. And, you know, through the last couple of years, I've had this, you know, that wrestling match that so many of us have had because we've been taught the Arminian way and we've come through churches where we've learned that easy decisionism, seeker-friendly Arminian thing. And then the Lord changes our view point through the scriptures of what the scriptures say about how you're saved. That's, that's, a, that's a wrestling match that could take quite some time. Um, you know, there's several right here at the table that have been transparent about how that wrestling match has been difficult for them. And so... It, I get it. Like like he said, that's the tension. The tension that's in the scriptures of of God does expect men to repent and to be saved, but yet they can't do it unless he intervenes. So you, that's where all the it's not fair thing comes from and all that stuff. And again, it's God is sovereign. He's the potter. He is God. I'm not. He, he does things. His ways are higher than our ways. The secret things are for the Lord. All the things that the scriptures tell us is to accept it and believe it by faith because that's what the Bible teaches. That's what it says. So. Good. All right, well, let's move on. Uh, the Niagara Creed. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about this. We've seen through the course of this study many councils and creeds and things like this. But now as we're getting into the 19th and transitioning into the 20th century, um, we've seen many gifted preachers in evangelists. We just talked about some of them last week with Billy Sunday and D.L. Moody and uh, Charles Spurgeon. And we've seen how many of them have been holding true to the Orthodox Church uh, teachings and Orthodox Christianity. But we've also seen uh, negative influences on the church, which we were just talking about before in, in the last 10 minutes or so in, of our review time. So the question is, what does the church of the future look like? What does the church of the 20th century, what is that going to shape up to be and what is that going to look like as we're getting into the 1900s? Obviously now we're in the 21st century. 
but this is, understand, recent modern day church history, right? We're talking only 100 years ago or so, you know, and, and now getting into less than that. So what is it going to look like? And, uh, and it's interesting because we see the fruits of it today and we see what it looks like and certainly we understand it a lot more um, as we go through these things. 1878, there was a group of conservative Bible scholars, okay, and what they did was they met together to have kind of like one of those councils that you think of Council of Nicaea in 325 and those seven ecumenical councils we've seen over the course of this study, kind of similar to that, to say, hey, let's define, and they came up with 14 um, just because, you know, um, 14 doctrinal principles that they believed outlined really the, the orthodox teachings. Um, this is what they believe to be the core fundamentals, if you will, of the faith of biblical Christianity. Okay, so I'm going to give you that, that list of those 14 here in just a minute. This group that meets, uh, they met at the Niagara Bible Conference. That's why it becomes called the Niagara uh, Creed. So that's what these 14 points become, they, because the name, because they met there and they discussed these things. And this will then after that be called uh, fundamentalism. And we're going to talk about that and define that a little bit more uh, tonight moving forward. You're going to have the fundamentalist. You're going to have the modernist. Um, we're going to talk about a couple other groups and differentists. We're going to talk about um, evangelicals, um, just kind of defining these words as we move forward. So when you hear fundamentalism, what do you think of? You hear fundamentals. That's what these guys are all about. They're about getting together and saying, well, just like what we talked about, the councils in the past, that thing with Pelagius versus Augustine, and then also later on with Arminius versus Calvin. There were sides to this. They were showing their side of this is what I believe the scriptures say, this is what I believe the scriptures say, and the church sided on these things and decided on these things. They decided Calvin was correct in the Orthodox view and Arminius was not. You know, and so there has been that over the over the course of time. Uh, but these fundamentalists are now going to be battling these modernists. And remember, we talked about modernists a couple weeks ago. These are the liberals. Essentially, if you're thinking in the political realm, we always think of you know conservatives and liberals. Well, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about fundamentalists, which would be the conservatives, and we're talking about modernists, which would be the liberals. Okay, um, liberal theology versus conservative fundamental theology. So we've seen the liberal. Um, Arminian, you know, all these different approaches infiltrating the church. We've seen the church significantly shift towards those sides. Uh, seminaries certainly affected by all these things. And these churches are going to have to make some decisions. Do these Orthodox churches that are in these denominations, as they see the denominations shifting and changing and going liberal, remember what we're talking about, saying, well, the Bible is a good source of moral rules for us doesn't mean that it's the infallible perfect word of god we, we aren't to think that but we can get derived good things from them and from philosophy and from our own knowledge and science and things like that and remember that's that's liberalism and so that's just seeped into the church and it's taking over uh, in in big numbers and so a lot of these churches that are trying to remain true to the orthodox teachings of christianity have to decide are they going to stay in these denominations and try to like fight this thing and battle it? Or are they going to leave the denomination, uh, you know, and join another denomination or start their own denomination? Or, or what does this look like? Okay. And certainly, I mean, this is on, this is headline news even in, in today. You know, um, we talked about that a little bit last week with the United Methodist Church and so many other churches, Episcopalian, that have certainly gone, uh, you know, way liberal. Um, so it's, in, in, in all denominations, I'll tell you that right now. Baptist, Presbyterian, it doesn't matter. There are liberal churches and liberal seminaries of every denomination all over the place. So this is the decision. Uh, these are the decisions that are placed before so many of these pastors, so many of these church members. So in 1910, we have what's known as the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, and they passed what's going to be known as the Doctrinal Deliverance. Okay, and these are the five points now of, of what's going to later be called the five fundamentals of the faith. Um, kind of like, you know, Tulip was named later because it kind of summed up the soteriology of Calvin and Augustine and of the Orthodox <coughs> Church. 
So I'm going to give you the list here in a moment of the first, the 14 that the first group meets and comes up with. And then after that, uh, this group comes up and lists essentially five that they would like to nail down uh, to be the fundamentals. Is that out of the 14 or that's two Yeah, you'll see that they are. Separate. Did I not number them? Okay, I didn't number them, but that's okay. We're going to start with them now. I promise you there's 14 of them. You can count them, we'll see. <laughs> um, so yes, you'll, you'll see in this that these are these are core you know these are good um so these these are good things kind of like uh brian was preaching yesterday and we were talking about church membership and he brought he's got a little booklet pamphlet of the 1689 the second london baptist confession and so that has like fundamentals and things that they would confess um you know as is part of the fundamentals of their faith you know their or their doctrine of of faith okay so number one is yes sir go ahead sorry I, That's I okay. What he was asking was like, is there fourteen plus five more? So, the first meeting happens, and there's fourteen of them listed by this group, this council that talks, because they want to head off this wave of liberalism they see coming, and they say, look, the stuff they're teaching, the stuff they're talking about is not true. Let, let's talk about what are the core fundamentals of what we believe, and so they're all in this room, and they come up and they list, and they happen to come up with fourteen of them. Then a few years later. Uh, there's going to be a council, uh, and they are going to come up with narrowing those down to five that they believe are the five uh, fundamentals of the faith. So out of the 14, they narrow down. Yeah, you'll certainly see four, the 14 reflected in the five. Yes. Right, and then the uh, five was a different group that narrowed it down. It wasn't yeah, and I'm, and I'm sure there were probably some of the same people, but yes. Yep. Right. Yep. Good. Thank you for clarification. Okay, number one, the verbal plenary inspiration of the scriptures in the original manuscripts. So certainly, uh, we would believe that that is an orthodox view. That scripture, what is he saying right there, essentially? Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God, or is God breathed. Okay, so the scriptures are infallible, they are perfect, because they are the word of God. It doesn't matter that there were, you know, X amount of, over 40 something authors over you know several hundred years and all the stuff that the liberals wanted to throw out there and of course that the world wants to throw out there at us none of that matters to us because we know and believe that all scripture is inspired by god no matter who penned it the holy spirit <coughs> penned it okay it's one of those questions hey who wrote the book of romans right and it's kind of like a trick question because okay well paul wrote it well okay but didn't the holy spirit write it so it's both and. Uh, so that's what we believe, is all Scripture is written um, by, by the Holy Spirit, by God. Okay, so second one would be the Trinity. Uh, Trinitarianism, we know, was part of that first Council of Nicaea, part of the first arguments in the early couple centuries of the church. Remember, they were always questioning the deity and the humanity of Christ and the Trinity. Is there only one God? Is there three God? That's, you know, three cer certain specific bodies and members of, of the one Godhead. And so they would say yes, and that's always been the orthodox view is of the Trinity. Okay, the third is creation of man, uh, and they lump this in with the creation and the fall and total depravity. So maybe somebody can tell us while I'm sucking on my candy here. Um, what is total depravity then? What are we talking about? Creation, we certainly understand. Genesis 1 and 2 opens up the fall into sin, right? Chapter 3. <laughs> um, so what does that mean? What is total depravity? And that, by the way, is the T, right, in TULIP. So that's going back a while with the five points of Calvinism or TULIP. What is what is total depravity? So without God, we were completely dead in our transgressions. There was no hope, nothing we could do to save ourselves. Good. Good. That there is no good, right? Romans 3.10, I think. Uh, none are good, no, not one. No one seeks God. Total depravity of man. Uh, the heart is evil and wicked, and who can know it? <clears throat> Psalms say. So you're wicked and you're evil and you're incapable of seeking God and you're incapable of, of being good because you're wicked and evil. That total depravity, that, that depravity is uh, sin nature, you know, that, that you are sinful and you are fallen and that all men are totally depraved. There isn't a goodness uh, to man to where they can still uh, choose to, to choose God or to do good. Okay, that's what total depravity is. The universal transmission of spiritual death from Adam. So that would be Romans chapter 5. 
the transmission, or I like to say uh, imputation, which means uh, crediting, uh, right? We just came through the last year and a half, we came through the Book of Romans in Sunday school here, so I know half of you guys are familiar with some of that. Came through Romans chapter 5, that's that imputation of Adam's sin was imputed or credited to all of us, right? Because Adam sinned, it says that all sin, and because all sin, all die. Key thing to remember on that in gospel presentation and in your thought process, there were three things that were imputed or credited, and all three of them were unfair. Because you say, well, Adam sinned. Uh, why does that make me a sinner? That doesn't seem very fair. First, I would tell you, uh, Adam did sin, and so would you, and so would I, okay? So put in the same position, we would have done the same thing because that's who we are. But Scripture tells us, and right in the book of Romans, you can find it all, that when Adam sinned, uh, sin was imputed to all men, okay? To all men and women, all mankind. Second thing was, when Jesus Christ went to the cross, your sin, as a believer, all who would believe in Christ, your sin was imputed or credited to Jesus on the cross. And he paid for that sin unjustly, right? Unfairly. Third thing is, in that moment that you become a believer, Jesus' righteousness is imputed or credited to you. Okay, so that's the three. Adam's sin is imputed to you and to me, to all mankind. Our sin as believers was imputed to Christ, and Christ's righteousness, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, says he became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, We're declared righteous by God. So that's all kind of in this uh, in this section here, okay? Transmission of spiritual death from Adam. So that's what we would call, like, original sin. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're declared righteous by God, but that's, like, at, on, the, on the judgment day. It no, would, it would... still no good sinners. Sure, but you're declared righteous at the moment of conversion. The moment you, the moment the Lord takes your heart of stone, gives you a heart of flesh, He changes your heart, He changes your will changes your desire, you start that sanctification process, he's declared you righteous then. You were, he, he knew, remember that he foreknew you and predestined you to be saved before he created the world. From that point forward then you, you, you choose well, to do. Well, that's what I would say. It's a, again another one of those seeming conundrums of scripture uh, because he clearly says that in Ephesians 1 and when you go back to Romans 8, Romans 8 says uh, those who he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And those who he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. So, meaning all those that he chose to save by his mercy and grace, he knew he was going to do that before he ever created anything, before Adam even ever sinned. But he, he obviously knows the beginning from the end, or the end from the beginning, and in both ways and all the ways. And so... In that, don't get too caught up in it. The, the, the concept is this, that while you were even, he knew that Sky Stanley, he was going to save you on this date at this time, whenever it was that he converted you. When you heard the gospel and he used it and converted you and changed you and saved you, you still are dead in your trespasses before that. Understand, it doesn't mean that you were saved before the foundation of the world in the sense of, well, I was, I was, you hear people say, like, I've always known Jesus. I've always been saved. I can tell you right now, the first, I got saved around maybe 26 years old, somewhere in that, whatever the number was for you, 40 years, 50 years, 10 years, 28 years. The time that you lived outside of Christ, you were a no good, lousy, rotten sinner, and you had the wrath of God and his condemnation upon you. But the fact is that he knew that he was going to show grace and mercy upon you and which he still chose to do. So the answer to your question is yes and no. That yes, you still were a sinner, and yes, you still are, and that's why the importance is, going back to the words that we choose carefully, is that the Bible says you were declared. You are declared righteous. You are not righteous, okay? You are not righteous. You did not earn righteousness. Um, you did not earn God's favor. You were declared righteous because of what we talked about at salvation. Jesus' righteousness was accredited or imputed to you, so God declares you righteous, saying that, yep, he's a sinner and no good, but my son died for him, and he is righteous. 
You would understand? think that if you're declared righteous, from that point you would be sinless. But it's not true. Because that's, you're still... <laughs> that's right. Be because you're declared righteous, he says you're righteous. You aren't righteous. <laughs> truly. A, a, truly, you have to have, that's sense. why you must have Christ's righteousness imputed to you. Or, or there's no salvation. So, so think of it like this. This is a good way. Stephen Lawson says it this way, and I really like it. So it's an accounting term is what this imputation thing is, a credit, a crediting your account. You have a negative balance, right? You're in the red, uh, and you have negative in your account. Jesus dies on the cross for your salvation. So it takes your negative account and brings you back to zero. Yes, understand? But, as Lawson says, zeros don't get into heaven, okay? It does that, which is good. It wipes away your sin, brings you back to a zero balance. But, to enter into heaven, you must have a positive in your account. You must be in the black. You must be righteous. So, he deposits his righteousness upon you, so that now you are in the black, and you are able to be righteous. So, hopefully that might help. It's so funny, because as you're saying, it's on the board right there. You're necessarily in That's right. That's right. Everything we're saying is summed up in, in those things. That's why you must have necessity of a new birth. You must be born again. He, uh, John 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, right? You must be born again um, to, to, to enter the kingdom, to be saved, which means that there must be redemption by the blood of Christ. Uh, Hebrews 9 and Hebrews 10 talks about um, atonement and redemption through the blood. And, but that it was not that you were ever saved. So it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission remission of sins and then uh, a few verses later in, in chapter 10 verse 4 it says but it's not that the blood of bulls and goats ever removed sin because it didn't only the blood of Christ the perfect lamb of God Isaiah 53 only the blood of Christ removes sin okay which is why when that happened there was no need anymore for the Old Testament economy of killing bulls and killing and, and there was never a need understand guys of that in the Old Testament it was just what God chose to do to make a picture, to make an image, to point all things in the Old Testament, point to the New Testament. They all pointed to Jesus is the sacrifice that will, his blood will take away the sins of all those who believe in him. Not the blood of bulls and the blood of goats and all the, all the sheep and all the things that they all killed back in the Old Testament. It was a picture to show blood must redeem you and it's the blood of Christ that does that. And it all pointed to, that's what Isaiah 53 is all about. The Old Testament, written to the Jews, to be about the Lamb of God who was coming to do, to take care of all the sacrifices, because the sacrifices really mean nothing. Well, I mean, he's a judge. He's he has the authority to declare. You know, it's like a judge in a courtroom. You don't necessarily have to be innocent. If the judge says you're innocent. That's it. Court cases over. You might not be innocent, <laughs> yeah. but he declares you innocent in that court good. case. I mean, he has the authority to do that. Yeah. Good. Declares you righteous. Uh, yeah, good. But in the Old Testament, God asked them to make those sacrifices. Yes, he commanded Jesus. them to do it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And even even the making, you find out from Hebrews, like what I was saying about the blood, about the atonement, that it was all pointed to Christ. Hebrews talks about the, the temple, and, and it's he gave them the specifics of how to make the temple because it, ref, it was a reflection, a picture of the temple in heaven. The, the altar and all the things, Everything that they did was to point to what was coming and what is to, to be and what is the truth. Thing. But in the ultimate one we want to see is all the sacrifices and all the blood atonement and all that was pointing to what Jesus was. He never made us do like with Abraham. He did the entire picture, but he never made him do it. He didn't do what what, what God did, what yeah. Jesus did. Yeah. It was like A Mount too Mariah. much for us. The cup, the cup you can't drink from. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, on uh, Genesis, what is that, 22, 21, 22, right, sacrificing his son. Yeah. Yeah, yeah going, going to kill going Isaac on Mount Moriah, um, which, and that's the sight. You know, the irony and the uh, awesomeness of God, Mount Moriah, where he told Abraham to sacrifice his son, would be about a thousand years later. Um, is that right in my time frame from to David? What am I thinking? Am I right here? Um, Jonathan Bryan? So, roughly, let's say, a thousand years later, date King David comes on the scene, and God has him buy a threshing floor from a man named Arna, who is a Jebusite, which was the name Jebus... Jebusites were the people who lived in Jerusalem before 
before they took Jerusalem. So he bought the floor, this place at Mount Moriah, which later was going to, his son Solomon was going to build the temple there. And then a thousand years after that, God would kill his son on the cross at that same place. Yeah, yeah pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. That's where, that's where it was at? Yeah, Mount Moriah, where, where Isaac was to be offered, is the same spot where David bought the threshing floor because God told him to, and Solomon, his son, built the temple there, and that's where Jesus died. Huh. Same place. So same in, place that in, in that Genesis that he just kept coming to the same spot all the time. It's like right. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. That point on earth. Yep. Yep. Good stuff. Then Jesus, like, tore the temple down. God. Do and yep, certainly. Yep, earthquake. Because they didn't. Because the Jewish people that had built it. And even that didn't get it. They were like. That's right. They were like, well, even that sky is symbolic. So when we talked cold. about the altar and the temple and the blood and all that, it's all so just symbolic and pointing to Christ. Even so, was that when Christ died, the veil was torn in two, showing that there is no curtain and no holy place for the one priest to come and enter into the presence of God because now in Christ he is our high priest and we all have access to God without the veil and without the holy place and without the man that's a high priest that that is a man who has to atone for his own sins before he can even go in there you know what I mean like that's yeah. the picture is it's ripped it's done that's no more, no more, no more right that's right <clears throat> not necessary anymore. yeah but they still don't believe that. right like they believe Jews, right. Unbelieving Jews. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah, so much imagery, uh, you know, as you go through the scriptures, more and more and more. I mean, that's everything points to Christ. Everything. Uh, that's what all the Old Testament, everything points to, to Jesus. And, uh, you know, and certainly there's so much more in it than we even could possibly even fathom. <laughs> so we just keep deepening the well. But that's what these guys are on. I don't remember what number we're on. Uh, maybe some of you are numbering and tell me. But number next, um, I can tell you in case you weren't numbering. One, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Seven, eight, and nine. Number seven, salvation by faith alone in Christ. Sounds familiar to the Reformation, right? Um, the five solas and, and what uh, the, the Reformers would say and what we often say is salvation comes by what? By grace alone through faith alone. In Christ alone. Okay, salvation by faith alone in Christ. The assurance of salvation, which means, you know, if you want to say once saved, always saved, because uh, there are certainly many religions and, and many churches, even, you know, claiming to be Christian churches that teach that that's not the case, that you can lose your salvation and that you must keep continue to do sacraments and repentance and, and, and so on. To uh, And others teach, we talked about that, the second ministry that Jesus has now, uh, the, that was the Millerites, if you remember that, and, um, that Jesus is still doing a work in heaven on our behalf to earn our salvation. Uh, but but the, the, the point of the Bible is, and the, and the truth of the scriptures, is that your hope is found in Christ alone. Um, so when you believe in Christ and you believe in the gospel, you are saved. And, and as Jesus says, uh, no man can pluck them out of my hand. Right? No man can pluck them out of my hand. John 10, I think it is. So... Uh, that, that is impossible. No man can pluck them out of the Father's hand or out of my hand. The centrality of Jesus Christ in the scriptures, which is everything. We just talked about that, you know, off the cuff for the last ten minutes. Of everything we talked about in scripture points to Jesus. He is the central character. He is the main character. Uh, the word of God is written to reveal him. <coughs> right? Everything in the word of God isn't... This book wasn't written just so I can understand, uh, you know, what I might come to understanding about end times or, or about other things. Certainly it's good for that and profitable for that, as 2 Timothy 3.16 says. But the point of the scriptures is all about Christ. Uh, everything is about that. He is the central theme or that scarlet thread, if you will, um, through the scriptures. Okay. So, so far, so good, right? These guys seem to be pretty on point. Um, in, in my book, anyway. Uh, the Constitution of the True Church by Genuine Believers. Uh, and I would raise an amen to that. You guys have heard me say, look, just because these places call themselves churches doesn't mean they're a church. A church is who? A church is the body of believers. 
Uh, local churches certainly would be constituted by local <clears throat> believers. Um, so the true church or the Orthodox church, right? Um, small O Orthodox guy, right? Or small C Catholic church, the universal, the Orthodox church are all those who believe by faith in Jesus Christ. So that would be the true church. So in all our churches that may be preaching and teaching the Bible that are true, good, biblical churches, they all, I would say, have non-believers in them, okay, on a day-to-day -day basis or every Sunday or whatever that looks like, but the church is those true actual believers in each and every single local church, making up the, the universal worldwide big C church, if you will. Um, the big C church is you know, that one body of all believers. Okay, the personality of the Holy Spirit, which means, you know, just the person, if you will, of the Holy Spirit, which they would certainly, we already know, they talked about the Trinity, so certainly they would believe God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, so they mentioned the Holy Spirit here again to put emphasis, I think, on that, and, and probably rightfully so. I think we still tend to, in the church today, you know, look at the Holy Spirit almost as the you know, the kind of secret part of God that we really don't talk about too much or something, but, um, and maybe that's not the case, but it sure, it sure seems like it, you know, but without his, the power of his spirit, um, you know, we can't do anything. The believer's call to a holy life. What would we call that? The, your call to a holy life. Uh, well, Brian mentioned it in his, in his prayer. Um, Philippians, what, 4? that uh, live a life worthy of the calling by which you've been called, right? I think that's right, Brian? Philippians 4, 1 maybe? 2? I think it's earlier, but I'll look it up. Yep, thank you. Um, I know 2 is about loving others above yourself. Um, maybe chapter 3. Chapter 3, chapter 4, somewhere in there. Um, we'll have that here in a second. So uh, Paul says that, you know, being living that life worthy of the calling by which you've been called. So that's sanctification, right? Living that life to continue to be holy to continue to be more like christ because god says be holy for i am holy um jesus wraps up the um, sermon on the mount in matthew 5 6 and 7 by saying be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect <coughs> that's a pretty high call good number next last two i think right sky is this uh was that 12 that was yeah, this is 13, 14. Good. The immediate passing of the souls of believers to be with Christ at death. Uh, there is no soul sleep. Remember we talked about that in a lot of the cults and the religions. Soul sleep being this state of, of nothingness or a state of place, uh, kind of like a purgatory in the Catholic Church, if you will, that from the time whenever you die and until Christ comes again, however long that is, you're in soul sleep waiting for him to come so that you get a resurrected body. Uh, but the scriptures say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It doesn't talk about there being a waiting game or a waiting room or a waiting time. Um, certainly you will be waiting on your resurrected body, okay? But where are all the souls of the saints right now from Adam and on? Uh, or or who, was, who was the first person to die? Who was the first person in the Bible to die? Huh? Don't think too hard. Abel. Good. Uh, Abel was the first one to die, right? But certainly we know Adam died. They're all right answers. The first one would have been Abel. So, and he, and he talks about that. Jesus talks about the blood of Abel uh, calls out to me. You know, the blood of your brother calls out to me. So, um, point being, from Abel to Adam to David to Abraham to all we've listened to, all that have passed and, until now, they're not all sleeping, you know, for millennia is waiting for Christ to come and wake them up. Uh, they are present with the Lord in their being, which is your soul. Understand, you are a soul with a body wrapped around it. We're not a body, you know, with a soul. I mean, this body is going to decay and be gone, and it will wither away, and certainly it will die. But you live forever because your essence and your being, your soul, is inside of this body. You know, uh, that's who you are. Um, and so in that, that lives forever for everyone, and we know that. And it will be for all eternity living in one of two places. Um, so praise God. If, uh, if we've been converted and saved because we get to ultimately live forever basking in the glory of our, of our Savior. So that's awesome. So that's an immediate thing is what they're saying. And then the last one is premillennial second coming of Christ. So they're saying in that 
uh, that Christ's second coming, he will return pre-millennial, which means what? Before the millennial, which is talking about the millennium kingdom that Jesus is going to um, bring to this earth, which we find in Revelation 19 and 20. So uh, Jesus one day is coming back, and he will judge the wicked, he will save the righteous, and he will usher in a 1,000-year reign here on the earth. And yes, I believe that is all literal, and it will happen. Um, and so that means before that millennium kingdom can happen, Christ must return. And I would say we certainly here at this church teach that and believe that. So, uh, questions, thoughts on those? Pretty solid, right? Did they miss anything? Did we miss anything in our discussions? It's like, hey, where do you start when you talk about the fundamentals of the faith? Because you can go, you know, we can continue to go. Now there's many, many, many doctrines. You know, like we talked about the Calvinism, Arminianism thing. That doesn't save you. You're saved by grace through faith alone, just like it says. But in that, like Sam said, you can have more perfect understanding of what the scriptures say about an Arminian view or a Calvinistic view or about a premillennial view or an amillennial or postmillennial view on on eschatology or end times. You know, you can certainly have different doctrines and different teachings and different beliefs <clears throat> on all those things. And those, uh, a lot of us or a lot of churches would list as maybe secondary or tertiary areas. That the primary areas would be the fundamentals of the faith, which is what they're trying to key on here. That that we at this table, as a body of believers, even if there's four or five churches represented here, I would say these 14 points of these these core things that they've described, I would say we've got to be in agreement on these things. That if you're not, we probably need to have a little bit more discussion to see if you're truly you know, a believer or not. Um, and I have to go through all those 14s, and we'd have to look at them a little bit more in depth. But... I think they're a pretty good start and pretty good list of the core fundamentals of, of the faith. But, again, you may be here and you say, well, I don't believe in a premillennial second coming. I'm um, ill, and you can certainly be saved. So, again, um, some of these, though, are core to, to verse, to combat, remember their thought is they're combating the liberalism and the liberal theology that's coming in, which the big, is, you know, creationism and the infallible, scriptures so that i would say is a certain big one okay uh we can't be sitting at this table and no matter what church you're going to i don't think you could say that i'm a christian and i'm a believer but you know i don't think this is the word of god i think it's i think men wrote it i think it's morally good but they missed things and they got it wrong here you know the virgin birth that really couldn't happen that's impossible you know going down that train of thought and that track i would say to you you're probably not converted <laughs> okay um, versus Stephen could be a mill and certainly could be converted and be saved and not believe pre So, So um, so some of those things I think you're going to see maybe they, they shrink this down later on to these five that we're going to talk about next. Yes, sir. I, I just, you know, when I think about it, like, I think that the major concern would be, like, you know, be aware, watch out for false teaching, you know, false teachers, false teaching. And so when we break it down and we go through history like this, and you see all the different opinions, you know what I mean? And there's been, like, this is only the last of the creeds that we've, you know, <coughs> people have come together and, sure. and, and argued over, you know, and we've, we've learned all about all these other, yeah. you know. Well, this one, don't picture this one like the councils before where, like you said, there was a debate or an argument of one side and the other side. This was a council that met, and these men just came up with what are the core beliefs. So it could have been, like, four or five or more churches represented and they're saying what are the core beliefs of okay you teach this you teach this and those actions but what are the things that make the fundamentals of christianity that's what they're defining because remember they're trying to fight the liberalism and the lies and the theology that are getting into all these churches that are done on an issue and it's a big deal you guys i mean we even talked about uh charles spurgeon in his division with the union baptist because the liberal theology and all the stuff that was seeping into the Baptist um, denomination, Spurgeon left. Spurgeon and his church couldn't deal with it. They're like, we're not. I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. Uh, this is wrong, and everything that you're saying is not uh, true to the scriptures. And and he left. 
so, you know, there's and today there's many that are dealing with those same things, whether it's a denomination thing or whether it's a you're in a specific individual church and you have to deal with, do I stay here and debate this and try to fix this or do I leave this? So it's certainly things that are pertinent today. Yeah. Obviously, they come up with 14 things because they were combating someone, you know, the liberals. Yep. That were trying to not go that route. Yep. Um, Good. So, you know, they made it like, I don't know. It's, 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 to me, unless unless you read it out of the Bible, which obviously, if you can read it out of the Bible, you make your own decision on it or learn it in Bible study. It's almost like, it's like, how many things can we disagree on? And still be on the same team. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because at some right. point it's like, well, what is the teams anymore? You know what I mean? Like, right. But that's that's so exactly it. That, but that's exactly it. And that's where even the fellowship of the saints comes in and why there's many, many churches and why we stress the importance of the local church and that there should be unity in that because you should be unified in the church where you are part of a local church to be a member there means to serve there to go there continually to be able to give your money knowing what what is happening there to be submitting to the the, to the pastors and the authority that is there to have the accountability that is there because you don't have it with all the churches the the members of the church here don't submit to the the pastors at the other churches i as a pastor here i'm not accountable for members at all these other churches we're accountable to, to those that God has entrusted with us and put in us, and so those things are a big deal because in the fellowship, maybe you're a church that, where you believe in infant baptism, and, and this church believes in believer's baptism, and you got to find those doctrinal distinctives and the things that you match up and are unified with a body in so that you can be a part, you know, in, in good conscience of doing those things. So it is very important. I was just a subject. We did this story talking. Ken Ham Foundation one that really right. struck me off because it's everybody's trying to blast the foundations of the Bible out like they've got a cannon shooting at the foundations trying to take so you can see okay this didn't happen or that didn't happen and it fought the new all that's right Yep, they're trying to just blast it away a little bit at a time and that's and that's what the world does and they're and they're still continuing to, hey, to try to do that hey Craig yeah so I'm trying to go through the 14 points. Okay. And, and you're would, missing one. No, no, no. <laughs> I, would, maybe. I would think that the importance and the significance of the resurrection would be in here. Sure. It seems like there's bits and pieces of it. Like you have the new birth. Right. You have the redemption. But it doesn't specifically say the actual resurrection. Good point. And, well, I think it, so there's a good transition into our five fundamentals, because you're going to see it here. <laughs> yeah, good. Let's, uh, let's look at these five, and you will see it in these five, uh, because, Peter, that's a great observation, I think a great question. Um, you know, when they're saying they believe in the Trinity, we believe in this, we believe in that, and they even mentioned, the, you know, the second coming of Christ and, and other things. Um, certainly, yeah, the bodily resurrection uh, is what Christianity is is hinging on, and you know, one of those things that it's at the core, certainly, of, of faith. So this is a different group. <clears throat> yes. Some, like you said, might have been part of the first group that killed the fourteen, but that's right. And still in that same collectively, that same group that is still battling. Remember, the these are still the fundamentalists. Right. So you have the fundamentalists against the modernists, or you know, again, the conservatives and the liberals. So the fundamentalists, that's pretty easy. You think of fundamentals. That's what they're trying to hold to. The modernists, it was pretty easy too, because think about our modern times and how liberal it is and where they're at. So that's what we're talking about. So these are still fundamentalists that are just honing in and just defining what makes us fundamentalists. What are the things that we say, the scriptures say, that we're going to stand on with all these modernists coming at us saying, that, well, yeah, you can't take that. That's not literal. That's spiritual. Blah, blah, blah. No, we believe this. You know, this is an actual bodily resurrection like are we reading the same bible yep. or what yeah. you know? well they are but remember they don't read it as we read it because they don't they just right. think it's a guide of good morals that men wrote or something right you so gotta figure that That's it's a good fable saying they're over there slamming their hand out like what are you serious why do yeah. you even think something like 
David, I've got some, some guys just coming into town and probably started helping out, checking in at Chief, so I'm sorry for being so rude, but... Don't worry. Really Thank you, mate. Good. Appreciate Good. it. See you. I'll talk Good. to you later on, buddy. See you, mate. So, number one, let's hit these five and uh, see if I can get to a stopping point here shortly. The inerrancy of Scripture. We don't need to dissect these too much because I think we're going to understand that. Infallibility and inspiration by the Holy Spirit, the inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, number two, the virgin birth and deity of Christ. So see, they, they, lit, they still tweak it and they change it a little bit. Uh, but again, the virgin birth is significant. It was certainly prophesied and it was a big deal because now as we talk going back to you know discussions as we've unpacked these things, why is the virgin birth a big deal? Because as we said in Romans 5, through Adam and through his line, sin has trickled down the entire line. Okay? So that all have sinned. So because of Adam, sin was imputed to all mankind. Well, guess what? Jesus wasn't born of Adam. That's why you have virgin birth. He wasn't born of men. He was born of the Holy Spirit. And you say he was born of a woman, and certainly he was, to have physical birth given to him. Uh, but she was impregnated, if you will. Uh, she conceived because of the Holy Spirit of God uh, giving her conception of, of Jesus Christ. So that is significant and important. If Jesus was born in sin through the act of how babies are made, then he was just born like a another normal man and if he died and stayed dead he died just like an ordinary man uh there was a miraculous awesome you know god powered thing done in his birth and in his <coughs> after his death uh and that's what makes jesus jesus okay so significance and obviously the deity of jesus christ his his godship and lordship um that he was uh remember hypostatic union 100 percent man and 100 percent god How's that possible? No it idea. Is. It is. Because God said so. Okay? So, substitutionary atonement uh, through God's grace and human faith. It's funny because a lot of this is coming into so much play. Uh, I'm, I'm already been kind of preparing for preaching, um, John and Brian, on, uh, I think I've got a month coming up now, but I've been working on that, and it's a lot of this, this stuff. Atonement. Substitutionary atonement. So what does that mean? We already talked about atonement. Did Jesus' blood pay the penalty for our sin? Substitutionary means what? He was the substitute. He died not for his sin. He died for our sin. His blood was shed not to pay for his own sins, but to pay for the sins of all those who would believe in him, which happens by God's grace. And there you go, Peter. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, because it is fundamentally foundational, um, and it is key to the gospel. It is the gospel. Paul says clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, without a resurrection, you don't have the gospel. You have no hope, and we are men, you know, to be pitied more than any other men because uh, our, our hope and our faith is in vain, and we are stupid, and we are preaching foolishness, and it is nonsense uh, because without the resurrected Christ, you don't have the gospel. Uh, you don't have salvation. You don't have substitutionary atonement. You have nothing. Okay? If, if they ever produced the body of Jesus, Christianity was dead at that point, right? Okay, so uh, the authenticity of Jesus' miracles, that seems to be kind of an odd one that they would throw in there, the fifth one, but again, if you think about what they were combating, think about what they were combating in these liberals, these modernists, they were picking apart the Bible. And so they're saying the authenticity of the Bible is based, you know, a big part of that is the authenticity of Jesus' deity, is his miracles, is his resurrection, is who he is. Everything he did is what the scriptures is all about. Um, so that's the fifth one that they, they place in there. That all that he did uh, because of his deity and, uh, and through his resurrection. So those are pretty, pretty strong ones, okay? I think those are pretty strong fundamentals. I mean, that's what the Bible says about why, that's why Jesus strong. was doing the miracles, right? Right. Was for authenticate. Right? Right. I stumbled on a show the other day that was, uh, that was like, I think it was, it said something like the, the, the walk to, um, it was like the last week of Jesus' death or something, and it was a show, you know? And it was, yeah. It brought you over, it was a documentary, and but it was led by... Obviously, now I see it was led by this liberal type groups. Yeah. 
you know, and they're giving reasons why. Um, Naturally, how it happened. Yeah, that, yeah. and also they were trying to, you know, trying to disprove a lot of things. And they were saying like, oh, why did they write it this way in the Bible? Oh, they did that because to make Rome look like they weren't, uh, you know, their his hands were clean. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it was all on the Jews and this and that. And I'm thinking to myself, it was all preordained. You know what I mean, yeah. like they they played an important part of, yeah. you know, what God Amen. intended from the he beginning. He orchestrated it. Yeah. That's right. He the, he he needed for those Jewish people. He needed for uh, Judas to to Amen. do what he did. You know? Amen. And if you think about it, listen to that. Somebody listening to sermons on Sundays. Good job. If you think about it, they've been doing it for years and years, spinning it to conform to the narrative. That they're trying to sell to this new group. Yeah. So it's the same word. Well, think Jesus. about it. And a lot of them will do that, even seminary professors and pastors and church yeah. leaders, because they're trying to fit the worldview into the right. biblical worldview. Believable. And they'll say that they're Christians, but they're trying to merge these two things. And so that's why you'll watch the History Channel things. And those are totally secular, but I'm just giving this as a bad, bad example that... Uh, you know, well, Moses and the plagues, and sure, the Red Sea was red because there was these red algae tides and great numbers that came in, so the water looked red. It's always those right. things. Yeah. And so certainly we know that, um, you know, you've got to believe by faith. Uh, but let me let me try to finish out these last couple slides, if I can, to get to a good starting point for next week. 1920s to 1930s. Um, so this is where we are now. We're approaching the mid-20th century. We see this battle. Okay, that we're talking about fundamentalist versus modernist, conservatism and and uh, Christianity versus liberalism, which really isn't Christianity, as we've said so many times. So that's going to continue to happen. And I want you to understand a big piece of this, and you'll see the significance in in our day and age and where we're at. Okay, significance here is creationism versus evolution. This is the time of Charles Darwin. Okay. Theory, Darwin's theories and in all this this is where we're at philosophy human reasoning science um, so creationism versus evolutionism I want you to understand is a huge part of this this battle and this controversy again it's the science liberal this thought of now the theory of evolution versus biblical creation uh, really is at the heart of all this and I'm going to give you kind of what happened at the beginning we know certainly where we are today but this man, John Scopes, was a science teacher, 1925 in Tennessee. And he actually got put on trial because he was, um, to be convicted, he was accused of teaching Darwin's theory and teaching evolution in a public school. Okay, this is how this started, because you should, certainly couldn't be teaching that, because to that time, schooling would be teaching biblical creationism and, and teaching God. Okay? Scope was found guilty of teaching evolution in a public school, that he was not allowed to do that, not supposed to be doing that. Um, the verdict, however, actually was overturned um, because of a technicality. And so everything shifted at that moment um, with the view of the fundamentalists. Certainly by the secular world, they looked at it as, oh, these Bible thumpers are trying to, you know, trying to go against us because we can't have a voice. Uh, you know, just like what they do today, but it started, you know, out small. Now today it's huge. Uh, but so this stuff happened, and now this is where we've seen this shift um, happen in these denominations as they go liberal. I've even had, you know, there's professors you can listen to, pastors. I've been at a church where I had these discussions with uh, the pastors that were there, um, you know, whether it's believing the old earth thing, um, you know, that the earth is billions of years old, and um, God, or, or even theistic evolution is a thought where there is a God and they believe, you know, they claim Christianity and they're believers and they say God started the evolutionary process and allowed it to take billions of years to happen. You know, all that kind of, I would call liberal theology um, is what's happening in the churches. And so you see the denominations starting to split. You see um, colleges and seminaries and institutions going liberal, and then obviously we know that trickles down into the high schools, into the elementary schools, into the middle schools that, that we see today, where clearly you are not allowed to teach Bible, you're not allowed to pray in the schools, um, they are teaching religion of evolution, make no mistake, that's what it is, evolution is a religion, they have faith in that, and they um, go against anyone that, that tries to say that they have faith in the 
in the uh, Bible and in God and in creation, um, even the schools, local schools here. Um, I know of so many kids <clears throat> of Christian homes and things that, you know, had to deal with the adversity and, you know, for lack of a better word, quote unquote, persecution of, of being a believer, um, you know, and being stupid for what you believe and let us teach you the right things with our indoctrination of our uh, religional and, and beliefs. Okay, so again, this becomes a, a problem and continues to be a problem in, uh, in the modern church um, and in obviously going into the schools and things like that. Um, we've talked about that enough, but well, let's talk about this third group as we close. So fundamentalists, we talked about fundamentals. They want to stick to the truth of the scriptures. The modernists, they are the liberals. They uh, they want to mesh and blend their, their worldview, their secular worldview, but yet still try to hold on to that label of Christian, saying that they still, are, you know, that they are Christians. And really, when you think about it, guys, that's, what, that's the world we live in. The rest of the world looks at America as what? A Christian nation. E even our pol pol uh, politicians in, in our world, uh, in, excuse me, in our country would say, yeah, well, and actually, I think it was Barack Obama a few years ago said that America is no longer a Christian nation. My discussion, if I had one with Obama, would say America hasn't been a Christian nation for a long time. Uh, but the world, my point is, views us as a Christian nation, quote unquote, because of the liberal, you know, good works and things that uh, that they tend to see about we're, us. We're it's not that Christian, we, we're more Christian than they are. I mean, as weak as it is, maybe. Right, maybe. There are certainly places that would be more Christian than us. <laughs> but yeah, good point. Good point, Tom. If they look at being a Christian as just simply a believer, yeah, they don't. That's what I'm saying. You don't. Uh, the world's view, the world's definition of Christian has nothing to do with Jesus' resurrection and the gospel yeah. at all. I mean, every every Gallup poll and every poll that you're going to see is going to just say Christian. They're just naming anyone. If you're born in the United States, essentially, you're a Christian. If you're not Roman Catholic... Because you're not the other thing. Yeah, if you're not Roman Catholic, you're not Muslim, you're not Jewish, you're... And actually, that sorry, they put Roman Catholic in there. I didn't mean to say that. If you're not Catholic Islamic, is if you're not Jewish, uh, what may, if you're not um, agnostic and atheist, because those are the big groups now, then if you're not one of those, you're a Christian. So Roman Catholic, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, so Baptist, Presbyterian, you're all Christian, which we know is just not true. <laughs> okay, but let me let me get back on point here. Uh, let's close with this third group. There's the two groups. Third group we find is this middle group, and they are called the indifferentists. So these names at least are helpful because they make sense. So they're indifferent to this whole debate in this conflict that's going on because they are believers and they're Christians but they don't want to stay and join the fundamental side of trying to combat the secular world thing <coughs> they just don't want to have that fight they want to say we can still do what we're doing and, and keep the peace with all the liberals and all the churches and these are the people that um, you know kind of will keep the peace and let's all have unity it's all about love let's just all you know get along and so, um, yeah, we're going to stop there. We'll, we'll go with this next week. So those are, are who the indifferentists are, and we will talk some about that next week. In fact, um, just kind of tip of my hand a little bit, an indifferentist would be, we mentioned last week some of these guys, um, certainly Billy Sunday was a fundamentalist in, in his campaigns and his approaches, but we talked about how that uh, trickled down into Billy Graham. Billy Graham was an indifferentist. Okay, and we can talk. We'll talk about more him, about him last week. But in a sense, what I'm saying is, a Christian man and a believer, but he didn't want to have that fight. He didn't want to have that battle. Um, and many, many, many churches have that same approach in in their methods and in the things that they do. They don't want to battle and combat things, so they will join forces and be polite with Roman Catholics or with other religions that aren't Christian. But yet they will join with them and help, you know, and, and have them in parts of things that they're doing and be okay with that because they don't want to offend people and they don't want to have that fight. With them. Kind of like Paul. I would say not like Paul uh, because in the sense of um, Paul said, certainly I try to be all things to all men, but he meant in bringing them the gospel. Paul, was, Paul wasn't bending 
you know, say with the Jews at that time, to say, oh, oh yeah, no, it's okay that they want to they want you to be circumcised, or it's okay that they think you must believe in Jesus and keep the Ten Commandments, he would call them out and say, no, that, that's not what it is. And what I'm saying is Billy Graham was not that guy. He was not ever saying to the Roman Catholics, like, you guys don't believe the same gospel as me. He was always just saying, like, oh, yeah, we're the same. You know, and it's that's the modern-day acceptance and tolerance that we see in most of the church is, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, Roman Catholics are Christian. Yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses are Christian. And like I said, the world does view it that way and lumps us all into one group of Christian of Christians, but certainly we know that that's not the case. So anyways, we'll talk more about that next week. Uh, thoughts, comments on cl in closing? That's why it's so important mm -hmm. to have those because then you have all these other religions that are not... Christian, but they say they are, and then, it, then the lines get really blurry. And it's like it's almost like uh, infiltrating the other side. You know, what I mean? it's like a spy almost. Like hmm. not really on your side, but I'm gonna be in all the meetings and stuff. <laughs> well, I mean, think about it, uh, guys. As I said, we we should be wrapping up next week, but I mean, this has all been pointing to and leading us to where we are in the church today, which we talk about all the time. Uh, because it's hard to miss, um, you know, the seeker-friendly, be tolerant, be accepted. Let's just be unified with, uh, you know, all the all the goats and all the non-believers, and let's invite them in, and sure, let's get along. And I'm not saying, guys, we don't separate from, you know, Tuesday nights. We have we have ladies that come from the Catholic Church. We have ladies and gentlemen that come from, you know, plenty of non-believers. Obviously, on Tuesday nights. Um, and if non-believers come into the church or Bible study, great, that's awesome. We don't kick people out. But my point is, in, in like in Sunday school yesterday, we're, we're talking the next couple weeks on uh, evangelism. That's not evangelizing. It's, it's not when you're being a witness and you're being a testimony to somebody and you're being polite to them and you're being accepting of them. Perhaps you're helping your neighbor take out the trash. These are all good things, yes? They're good. They're good works that we do. But that's not evangelizing, and we're commanded to evangelize. Uh, nobody ever got saved by you not opening your mouth and telling them the gospel. They didn't get saved because you were nice and took their trash out, uh, because you were the best neighbor they ever had, but they didn't get saved because you never opened your mouth and told them about Jesus Christ and about the gospel. Then you didn't evangelize. Um, and, and so that's my point, is that Paul would do that, and we are called to do that. So we don't say, oh, you ladies can't help us, or oh, you guys shouldn't be here. We welcome them with love, but we want them to get saved. So we want to give them the gospel um, and do that. Now, if people are, you know, saying, well, I do believe this and you're wrong in this and, you know, we're right or whatever, we're going to stand true on what we believe is the fundamentals of the scriptures. And so if that person is debating with us and saying, no, you must, you know, be baptized as part of your, or you must do good works and earn your way or whatever it is, then, then certainly we're not going to, this 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 church then isn't going to work out for us. You know this this thing isn't going to work out for us well. Um, so you understand what I mean. There definitely has to be unity in the fundamentals, um, certainly of Christianity. Does it mean that we um, aren't to evangelize? That we aren't to love on others with and loving on them is part of that is sharing the truth with them. And sure, is that relational? Do you do it the first conversation? Maybe not. Maybe it's a relationship that's established. But the point is. You're not loving them by by holding the truth back from them that is able to save them. Um, loving them is is giving them the truth of the gospel, uh, so that God may choose to love them as as well. You know, we're we're told we it's a common statement to say we as Christians are to be in the world but not of the world, right? Um, Lawson again with a good good analogy says uh, the boat is in the water, but the water ain't supposed to be in the boat. Okay, so that's that's the key. That's the point. Good. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>